Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Retro Wrestling Review Series Season 7, Episode 2. And today I'm going to be covering WWE Payback from 2014. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. I'm going to structure this the same way as I did my last video where I did it, uh, where I covered it after each take. Let me just go over some of the matches that were on this show. Uh, this was a very interesting time for the WWE because I remember the WWE Network was just launched and the WWE was going through a really bad time because they lost a lot in their stock. Um, so they kind of needed to deliver with this show. So let's go over... Um, I believe, too, they lost... And I think it was in. I, they had lost some. They released several superstars as well. No, that was actually no, that, that was uh, next month actually because um, I remember. But um, so let's cover some of the stuff that uh, took place on the show um, and like the matches that happened. So we have a kickoff match, which I uh, will be watching. We have a United States Championship match. Um, a couple of. Um, a few, a couple of singles matches, a tag team match. Uh, we have a Intercontinental Championship match, a Last Man Standing match, a Divas Championship match, and a No Holds Barred Elimination Six Man Tag Team match. Um, so on paper, this card actually looks pretty good. Was it? Well, let's find out as I review the show. Okay, so we had the kickoff. Um, we had Josh Matthews, Booker T, Kofi Kinston, and Alex Riley on the panel for it. I'll just say where these guys are nowadays. Josh Matthews is now in TNA, and for some odd reason, he's like, I guess it seems like he's like the biggest heel in TNA, because he ended up leaving the WWE, like, I believe it was like right after, it was like, it was a, it was in this year. Uh, Booker T is in the same spot, actually, and happy for him. Kofi Kinston uh, became one of the hottest acts in the company. Um, nowadays, he's going to become... He's now one of the longest reigning uh, WWE Tag Team Champions of all time. And Alex Riley would go on to continue being a commentator in NXT. He would eventually have one more run as a wrestler. And uh, then he would get released in 2016. Um, so that's what everybody there is doing. JBL... Um, well, yeah, hold on one second. So then we had JBL, Michael Cole, and Jerry the Ken Lawler on commentary. Uh, JBL does, now does commentary for SmackDown. Michael Cole's in the exact same role as he was in on the show. And Jerry the Ken Lawler now is, I guess, time, on a t part time basis. So then we have the actual matches uh, that, that are going to be on the show. I didn't really announce what they were, so I'll announce them. Um,. We have the kickoff match, which is, which is going to be a mask versus hair match. El Torito versus Hornswoggle. We have a, a United States Championship match between United States Champion Sheamus versus Cesaro. Uh, we have a tag team match between Ry Baxo and Cody Rhodes and Goldust. We have um, a, a singles match between Rusev and Big E. Uh, we have... Uh, I'll get into the next match that was announced later on in the, at the end of the show. Um, we have an Intercontinental Championship match between Intercontinental Champion Bad News Barrett and Rob Van Dam. We have a Last Man Standing match between John Cena and Boy Wyatt. We have a Divas Championship match between Divas Champion Paige and Alicia Fox. And we have a No Holds Barred Elimination Six Man Tag Team match. Uh, the Shield versus Evolution. So now that I've gone through all the matches, let me talk about the reason some of these matches are happening. Some of them they didn't go into, so I'll just talk about them now. Uh, the reason why uh, some of these a lot of these matches really don't have a lot of story behind them. The reason why the uh, United States Championship matches happened was because Cesaro had won the at WrestleMania 30, had won the first ever Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and uh, then uh, he became a Paul Heyman guy. For God knows why. He really shouldn't have been a Paul Heyman guy. He should have turned face, but they kept him heel. I don't know why they ever kept him heel. Because it was time to turn Cesaro face, and they didn't. And they wanted to find a way to keep Paul Heyman on TV, considering the fact that they wanted to keep mentioning the fact that Brock Lesnar conquered The Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania, which shouldn't have happened. And 
Sazawa and Sheamus um, had a match with each other on an episode of Raw where Sazawa won. So this got him this um, this got him this U.S. title match because Sheamus actually ended up winning the U.S. title from Dean Ambrose in a battle royal, which I'll get into why later. Um, the, uh, the reason why Rusev and Big E were having a match was because Rusev had just come into the company at this time. Uh, he was dominating everybody in the WWE, and he this was when he was a uh, pro Russia. He was rooting for Vladimir Putin all the time, and he tried to attack. Um, he tried to attack Hackshaw Jim Duggan in an episode in a segment on Raw, in which um, Big E came out and made the save. So. You know, that's why this match was happening. Big E had just lost his uh, Intercontinental Championship. Um, and then the reason why the Intercontinental Championship match is happening um, is because um, act uh, Bad News Barrett and RVD had actually had a number one contenders tournament finals match. Bad News Barrett 2 had just returned to the WWE. Uh, he, they changed his gimmick. Um, to Bad News Barrett, where he would come out and spread bad news to everybody, and he would just do that for months on a podium, and then he eventually started wrestling regularly um, after WrestleMania 30, um, and then eventually, um, there was a tournament to determine the number one contender to, to Big E's IC title. These two were in the finals of that tournament, and once Barrett was able to knock off RBD, who also just had returned after WrestleMania 30, and then, um, Bad News Barrett would go on at Extreme Rules to defeat Big E for the Intercontinental Championship. And then they had to beat the clock challenge for it, which RVD ended up winning. And then this led to this match, and not a lot really, not a lot really um, of storyline to that match either. Um, and then um, we have the Divas title match. The reason why this match was happening was because the night after WrestleMania 30, um, in Paige's first night in the WWE, uh, she had won the Divas Championship, and she would you know, go on to have matches and defend the title, and then eventually, um, Paige ended up knocking off Alicia Fox, um, on an episode of Raw, in which Alicia Fox just freaked out and completely went crazy, which I thought was awesome, and then eventually it led to Alicia Fox knocking off Paige, I'm gonna match up next week, and, um, and then she completely freaked out again, and, yeah, let me just see if it says anything else about it. Um, yeah, nothing really, um, too important, uh, there. So, yeah, that's, uh, not only really a lot of storyline behind those matches, so that's kind of what I didn't like about, um, those matches. So, um, let's get to the actual, now uh, let's, let's get to the actual matches that they talked about. So we have the build up for the, uh, six man tag team elimination match between Evolution and The Shield. And this matchup was huge because Evolution was a stable that was around from 2002 to 2005. Uh, they had consisted, it had consisted of Triple H, Randy Orton, Batista, and Ric Flair. And they dominated the WWE for years. Um, you know, Triple H hold many world titles while in this stable. Batista and I mean, Ric Flair were former world tag team champions. Randy Orton was a former intercontinental champion. And they dominated the WWE. And then eventually they ended up splitting up. And while they were split up, uh, in 2012, The Shield had debuted. And, um, you know, The Shield had consisted of Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns, and they were just like, they were considered just, they came into kind of the same way as Evolution did. The Shield came in at Survivor Series 2012, um, and completely took out all the top stars, um, you know, Randy Orton beating one of these stars, and The Shield was taking out everybody, they, um, Ended up uh, being undefeated on the team for about a year. They dominated the WWE. They even hold um, the they they were even all at one point champions as well. Dean Ambrose was the United States champion, and Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns were the WWE tag team champions. Um, and um, then. Um, when Triple H had turned heel, um, and had, they started the whole authority angle with him and Stephanie McMahon, um, and, uh, the Shield were considered Triple H's cohorts. Uh, they would always help out Randy Orton, who was the WWE champion, who was known as, uh, at the time, who was known as the guy that uh, was going to be the face of the WWE. So, um... 
the shield will constantly help them and then um Eventually, they started to kind of tease tension in the shield uh, in the beginning of the time. And Batista had returned in January 2014. He won the Royal Rumble match. And he was supposed to face Randy Orton for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. But then other people didn't want that to happen. And um, eventually... Um, the Shield had finally turned face. They ended up um, attacking Corporate Kane, and we found um, then eventually Corporate Kane and the New Age Outlaws ended up attacking um, the Shield. They just completely laid about on, on an episode of SmackDown, and um, all members, all three members of Evolution, ended up uh, losing their matches at WrestleMania, but they weren't really fully formed yet. But Randy Orton and Batista kind of formed a tag team. They went after, they tried to go after the, the WWE tag team titles, uh, but they really, they, um, they didn't really get the job done. To, and then um, the Shield ended up looking dominant at WrestleMania. They knocked off um, Corporate Kane and the New Age Outlaws, who were, ironically enough with Triple H, Triple H's buddies. And Corporate Kane had let it slip that Triple H is the reason um, that Triple H had told Corporate Kane and the New Age Outlaws to take him out. So, then on an episode of Raw, The Shield was supposed to have Triple H defeat Daniel Bryan, who was the WWE World Heavyweight Champion, but instead The Shield had a face-off with Evolution, and they finally had gone against the authority. So Triple H realized that they were going to have to take out the Shield or else they would never be able to hold any world titles ever again. And then the Shield attacked Randy Orton and Batista. And then Evolution finally had reformed. They took out the Shield. And um, at Extreme Wars, it was the Shield versus Evolution. And which uh, the Shield was able to knock off Evolution, which I personally think shouldn't have happened. I personally think Evolution should have won the match since they were just coming together. Um... So, Evolution got upset about this. Triple H made, um, put Dean Ambrose in a battle royal where it was going to look like impossible, where it was going to look impossible for Dean Ambrose to be, uh, successfully defend his U.S. title, and which is when Sheamus won it. And, um, then later on in the night, um, the Evolution had laid out the shield, and the shield and Evolution continued brawling with each other, and then it led to a contract signing where the Evolution was able to stand tall and triple powerball Roman Reigns through an announcer's table. And, you know, this was just one of these fantasy matchups that everybody wanted to see. Uh, it was the shield, it was Evolution. The shield, in a lot of ways, was like Evolution. Um, it built up just like Evolution, so it was, it was awesome. Um, I actually like this feud. It just... I just wish they had a couple of tweaks to it where um, I, I really wish that this feud match would have been so much hyped up more if Evolution had gone over at Extreme Rules, but whatever. Uh, and then continuing. But overall, good build-up matchup. I enjoyed it. Um, we had a mask versus hair build-up. It was between Hornswoggle and El Torito. Well, Hornswoggle and El Torito had a stint... Um, at the Hall of Fame, and then it led to a match on SmackDown where I believe El Torito won, and <clears throat> it led to that pure comedy um, We LC match where El Torito was able to win again, and the feud continued. It led to a go home episode of War where El Torito ended up uh, getting his tail ripped off by Hornswoggle, so this led to a mask versus hair match. Uh, but actually, this feud, I didn't like it at the time, because sometimes I took wrestling too seriously, but watching it back now, it's actually kind of funny, and it does have some co great comedy in there, so I think that's great. Um... Then we had the build-up for the uh, last man standing match between John Cena and Boy Wyatt. This is very interesting. So, um, Boy Wyatt had come into the company um, in 2013. Uh, he was actually, in, like I said in the last episode, he was actually geared up to come into the company. They were playing vin vignettes for him. And he had debuted in July of 2013. He was taking out all the top names and he was a force to be reckoned with. <clears throat> Then eventually, um, so then eventually, um, he went, he cost John Cena the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at, uh, the Royal Rumble against Randy Orton, um, and then he did it again in Elimination Chamber, inside an, an Elimination Chamber match, so it led to the match between Bray Wyatt and John Cena at WrestleMania 30, and which... Uh, John Cena, boy, he talked about John Cena's legacy um, and how he wanted him to join him and everything. 
and Cena actually looked like he was afraid of Bray Wyatt about and about everything that he could do. And this was a must-win situation for Bray Wyatt. He nearly needed to win at WrestleMania to put himself over, and then he lost. John Cena overcame the odds and beat Bray Wyatt. But it doesn't end there. So then they started doing this whole thing where everybody would light up their cell phones every time the way um, every time the Wyatt family would come out and they would say he's got the whole world in his hands. So John Cena wanted to face Bray Wyatt in the steel cage match where it was just him and him. Where it was just them two facing off, which really favored Cena because he was able to knock off the, the boy Wyatt uh, with the other members of the Wyatt family out there um, in a three on one handicap match, so he should have no problem um, <clears throat> knocking him off um, in a cage match. So. They had a handicap match on Raw, and with Cena won by disqualification, so he really couldn't. So the Wyatt family couldn't even defeat Cena in a handicap match. Cena actually nearly won the fucking match, um, and you know, Bray Wyatt was trying to go after all the kids, all the p- kids that loved Cena, and he even tried to go after Jerry the Kid Lawler on an episode of Raw. Cena ended up uh, taking him out, and he actually ended up going for help. He went to um, go. Um, for, to the WWE Tag Team Champions at the time, the Usos. I don't know why Cena needed help at all. Um, since he was able to take these guys out, like I said, in a 3-on-1 handicap match. And what happened in the Steel Cage match, by the way? In the Steel Cage match, Cena nearly won in that 3-on-1 situation. And the only reason why he didn't was because a, li- he, um, a little kid was sitting outside the cage. And it prevented him from escaping. And Boy Wyatt won. Wow. So this was a must-win situation for Boy Wyatt. And did he win? You'll soon find out. Alright, so, um... Then we have the build-up for Daniel Bryan's options. So let me talk about this. Uh, Because I have to talk about the build-up. So Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania had won the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. He finally achieved his dream and became WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Um, But Stephanie McMahon wanted to get this title off him. She tried sending Kane at him uh, in a new way masked form. Daniel Bryan was able to knock off Kane at Extreme Rules. and And the feud between Daniel Bryan and Kane was supposed to continue. However... Daniel, it was revealed that Daniel Bryan had suffered a neck injury. So he had to get neck surgery, so they uh, the, those plans got stalled. So Stephen McMahon, because he's injured, wanted him to give up the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Um, so Daniel Bryan refused. He said that if he gives this back, he's just handing something back that he had to fight hard for. And that means that the authority have won. Meanwhile, while this was happening, Brie Bella was feuding with Stephanie McMahon, sort of. Uh, she was upset that she continuously had Daniel Bryan get beat down. So she ended up shoving Stephanie McMahon backstage. And Stephanie McMahon gave Daniel Bryan an ultimatum. At payback, he either had to give up the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, or she would fire Brie Bella. Um, mainly the reason is, is I think the WWE was booked in a corner. They uh, wanted to get this title off Daniel Bryan. But I think uh, they weren't really sure if he was going to be injured or how long he was going to be out for. So, I guess that's what the whole situation was. It kind of sucked. Um, because Daniel Bryan had fought um, for so long. We really wanted him to be champion. He finally won the title at WrestleMania. And then this happened. It, it really sucked. Um, but there's more But there's more to it. And I'll talk about it later on in the show. And then uh, Nikki Bella gets interviewed. And she said that she hasn't talked to Daniel Bryan or Brie Bella all day. She talks about how... Brie Bella loves to be a WWE diva, but she also loves her husband, so we don't know what's going to happen. So that kind of was supposed to lead to something there, uh, but they do do something with this. Um, and then we had the actual ma- hair versus mask match itself. El Torito with Los Metadores, um win side versus Hornswoggle with 3 on B win side. And... Um, this match was fun, actually. I really enjoyed this match. It wasn't like a great technical wrestling match, but it was a nice comedy match, and they actually had me laughing at some points. Like, uh, when they did the Irish whip spot, where they both kept reversing, it was funny. Uh, they both ended up colliding heads, and Hornswoggle got, like, dizzy, and he didn't really know where El Torito was, so he ended up hitting a headbutt. That was funny. Um, and then eventually, Heat Slater tried to, uh, cut the tail off again of El Torito, but El Torito went under the, went underneath the wind, and it, he'd slay the chase after him, and, um, 
Um, El Torito went up on the apron. Hornswoggle knocks him down. Hornswoggle dominates the matchup for a while. Hits some funny spots. There was even a funny spot where uh, Hornswoggle was trying, where El Torito was trying to pin Hornswoggle, and Hornswoggle kept kicking out with authority, and the referee kept catching him. And when El Torito uh, kicked out, um, and uh, when Hornswoggle pinned El Torito, and he kicked out. Um, and the same thing happened to Hornswoggle. The referee didn't catch him. Instead, he just moved out of the way, which was really funny. Um, and then El Torito starts to make his comeback. He goes to go off the top rope, but he gets distracted by uh, Heat Slater and uh, Drew McIntyre. Los Benadores pulled him down. Jinder Mahal tries to hit a dive on him, but he, but he ends up busting his ass on the floor. Um, and... Um, one of the Matadors hits a sick dive on everybody, hits, um, and then Drew McIntyre dives on everyone. El Torito hits a hurricanrana, and Hornswoggle hits a, like a, um, like a bowl, rolls out like a bowling ball on everybody. El Torito hits a hurricanrana on the Heat Slater, and then eventually the finish comes uh, where Hornswoggle, um, where El Torito goes for like the uh, double foot stomp to the face uh, in the corner, but Hornswoggle ca- counters into a power bomb, and um, Covers him, El Torito kicks out. He goes to he take El Torito's mask off, and he takes it off. It's revealed that El Torito was wearing a second mask, but the commentators were trying to hype this up, like uh, that that actually was El Torito's face. And El Torito hits a springboard moonsault for the win. Uh, what really made this match, too, was the commentators, because they were making a lot of jokes about how they were both short and stuff like that, so I thought that was funny. Then afterwards, El Torito shaves off uh, Hornswoggle's head, and he just continuously cuts it. And 3MBs are gone at this point. And um, El Torito, um, Hornswoggle um, actually looked like Jack Black with his hair. And then when he took his hair, hair off, he actually looked like Jason Voorhees. And it's pretty damn true. And afterwards, after his hair gets... They don't really shave his entire hair off because... Uh, they because I guess they didn't have time for it, um, but I thought it was funny, and um, what was I gonna say? And then the aftermath came where this feud just pretty much ended, and nobody really benefited. I believe like about a week later, um, Drew McIntyre and Jinder Mahal were released, and they and Jinder Mahal returned in 2016, and he's pretty much a jobless still. Heat Slater was went on to become the first ever SmackDown Tag Team Champions. Um, and Drew McIntyre just recently returned on NXT. Um, he went to TNA for a while. It was TNA World Champion, Impact Grand Champion, and Los Matadores is now ha- now had the gimmick and the Shining Stars. And El Torito is now released, so no one really benefited. But I don't really care. This feud was fun, and I kind of wish they. Uh, uh, that it sucked that they only had two um, small wrestlers in there, so. And then we had the build up for the tag team match. Um, after WrestleMania, uh, they were trying on this whole story about how Cody Rhodes was on a losing streak and White Baxter was on a. Um, and uh, they were trying to tell that story pretty much. They would have matches and. Cody Rhodes continuously losing. So Ryback-so, which I consisted of Ryback and Curtis Axel, who became a tag team because they were both Paul Heyman guys. And yeah, how how far have these both fallen? A year ago on this show, Curtis Axel had won the Intercontinental Championship and then he, he, he didn't end up becoming a Paul Heyman guy anymore. Um, and they did nothing with Curtis Axel. And Ryback was fighting for the WWE Championship. He was this big baby face or big heel. But then eventually, like I said, he he fell really hard. Um, and really, and yeah, he was just relegated to this. Uh, it sucked for both guys. So Ryback, so, but Ryback so made fun of Cody Rhodes and Goldust backstage. And they shoved, and Goldust tried to get pissed, but Ryback shoved him. So this led to this match. And, um... Then we had uh, Cody Rhodes and Goldust are backstage, and Cody Rhodes says, "I realize that I that we haven't been um, on the winning ways lately." But he said that tonight that's going to change. So that was about it there. And then it, it announced a match on the show. It announced uh, Bo Dallas uh, versus Kofi Kingston. Uh, the build up was th- there's going to be more to this match, but. Um, 
Kofi Kingston was very vocal about Daniel Bryan having to give up the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. He had gone on Twitter about it and said that it's a shame that uh, Daniel Bryan's put in this position. He's worked really hard for it. And Kofi Kingston was very vocal that he didn't think that Daniel Bryan should be put in this position. And Bo Dallas, too, was a new superstar. He had just been called up from NXT. And he has the whole gimmick where you have to believe in yourself. So they talked about that for a while. So that was definitely interesting there. And that was the kickoff. It wasn't that bad of a show, actually. I had fun watching the uh, mask versus hair match. Um... And the segment with Nikki Bella wasn't bad. The Rhodes, uh, the Cody Rhodes Goldust segments weren't bad. So overall, the pre-show was okay. All right, so we had the actual show itself. We had the same people on commentary, and we had the first match on the show. It was a United States Championship match. United States Champion Sheamus versus Cesaro with Paul Heyman ringside. And before Cesaro comes down to the ring, Paul Heyman. Does an introduction for him. And this match was in Chicago. And uh, it was in CM Punk's hometown. And this is when CM Punk had just left the WWE. Um, and they were in Chicago. Um, and everybody obviously wanted CM Punk back. So they weren't going to get CM Punk obviously. So um, when they were chanting CM Punk, Paul Heyman said, I'm sorry, but he... Uh, but they didn't really reference Punk at the time. But he says he is in um, he he's in another arena watching the Chicago Blackhawks lose to the, another hockey team, and they t- um, and he pretty much puts over the fact that Brock Lesnar conquered the Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania, and he brings out Cesaro, and um, this was a really good opening matchup. Um, every time Cesaro and Sheamus are in the ring together. It's just magic. Whether it's as a tag team, whether it's you know um, opponents, they're in camp, they're they're just magic together. So Sheamus um, dominates the first half of the matchup. He goes for a uh, rolling senton. Cesaro counters into a back suplex. Cesaro goes for an uppercut. Sheamus counters it. He hits the ten beats of the Babin on Cesaro, throws him into the barricade, and then he goes for the. Uh, 10 beats of the bad win while Sheamus is on the apron. Cesaro is in the win. But then Cesaro hits an uppercut on Sheamus when he goes for the slingshot shoulder block. He hits a um, superplex from the apron on Sheamus. And Cesaro just dominates the matchup for a while. He hits a uh, butterfly power bomb um, onto uh, Sheamus. Kicks out. And he just... And he hits a double stomp. Sheamus kicks out again. And Cesaro just dominates Sheamus. And then Sheamus starts to make his comeback. He hits three knees um, off the top rope under Cesaro's chest. Um, off the middle turnbuckle. And um, then um, what else happens? Cesaro hits a um, six, six slingshot uppercut on uh Sheamus, he hits an uppercut from the middle turnbuckle, and then Sheamus hits a um, Celtic cross. Cesaro kicks out. Um, Cesaro hits like his little ank- um, hits a torture rack slam on Sheamus. Sheamus kicks out, and um, then Sheamus hits a spine buster into the uh, um, um, clover leaf. Um, and uh, Cesaro is able to get to the rope. Sheamus goes for a blow kick. Cesaro counters into another uppercut. And uh, then eventually the match finishes when Cesaro goes for the, hit, hits the sweat on Sheamus. And he's going to put him away for the neutralizer. But then Sheamus catches him into a roll up and gets the victory and retains the United States title. Cesaro is upset about this. And uh, I really like the match. I thought this was a really good way to open off the pay per view. Uh, my only gripe is I kind of wish watching this match back that Sheamus. No, that's Sheamus had lost, and Cesaro had beaten him and become the brand new United States champion. Because um, at the time, I was fine with Sheamus winning because Cesaro had gotten the advantage of the whole feud. Sheamus had just won the United States title. You can actually uh, later on down the line have Cesaro beat him for the U.S. title. But let, but now this is where I talk about the aftermath. So let's take a look at where the people went. So Sheamus. Went on to continue being a dominant United States champion. He defended it. He was ended up, he ended up, I think, getting suspended for 30 days. And then eventually him and Cesaro had another match at Night of Champions, where she- Sheamus retained again. And then Sheamus got injured shortly afterwards, and then he would uh, miss WrestleMania 31. Let's take a look at where Cesaro went. So Cesaro didn't win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship at Money in the Bank, which I'll get into that why. He lost a... Uh, 
Battle Royal to become the brand new Intercontinental Champion. Eventually, uh, he said he didn't want to be a Paul Heyman guy anymore. So then he pretty much jobbed out even more. He lost to RVD on that SummerSlam kickoff. Lost the U.S. title match, like I mentioned, to Sheamus. Um, wasn't on Hell in a Cell. Lost to Jack Swagger on the kickoff, his former tag team partner. Boo. He was pretty much jobbing out left and right. Um, he randomly formed a tag team with Tyson Kidd. And then he lost. Uh, no, he actually won. He was on the kickoff wrestling Kofi Kinson and Big E because that's when the New Day was formed. He was the WWE Tag Team Champion with Tyson Kidd, which was a good thing. He, Vince McMahon went on Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast and literally said that Cesaro can't connect with the audience even though everybody cheers for him every night. Everybody was cheering for him like crazy in this match. Um, and he pretty much was used as a joke. He retained the tag titles at WrestleMania. Then he lost the Andre the Giant by getting eliminated by the fucking Big Show. Um, lost the tag titles to Kofi Kingston and Big E. Stuck in a tag team for a while. Um, then he, uh, you know, uh, his Tyson kid got hurt, so they started using him, and they turned him face, which they should have done a year, um, a year, a year prior. He had amazing matches with John Cena for the United States title. He, uh, but he didn't win them. Um, he, let me think, he lost to Kevin Owens at, uh, SummerSlam. He, uh, I believe lost, um, he actually didn't even know. He didn't wrestle at Night of Champions. Uh, Helena saw he was on the kickoff where, his team, where he was on the winning team, but that's still not anything special. Then he was uh, injured, and then he, you know, I'll get into what happens when he returns. So, a year later, he was in the IC title match, actually, so he didn't really go anywhere. So, Cesaro went in the, uh, that Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Being in line with Paul Heyman did nothing for Cesaro. So, thinking about it like this... If you wanted to validate Cesaro joining up with Paul Heyman, if you wanted to validate, you know, Cesaro winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, Cesaro needed to win more. Sheamus would have recovered, and it actually would have been able to continue to set feud, but instead you decided to have Cesaro lose and look like a joke. What a joke. Um, so they're like, like they've ha WWE has had opportunity after opportunity to push Cesaro, they've mi and they've missed it every time. They're at least finally, they at least finally have some sort of groove with Cesaro, but not much. Um, but one thing, I, so there, I, I am a little bit pissed off now. But one thing actually that happened did happen three years later. Who knew that three years later, Cesaro and Sheamus would go on to have a best of seven series where Cesaro ended up turning face, Sheamus was had turned heel, and uh, they they ended up becoming a tag team when they wrestled for the tag tight for the raw tag team titles um, at WrestleMania. Um, who, who would have ever thought that would have happened? No one would have seen that coming. And now, I believe at Payback 2017, they're going to be facing the Hardy Boys for the uh, Raw Tag Team Championship. It's pretty interesting. Um, I never would have get, imagined that in a thousand years, but it's happening. So that's... At least as I was being used better now. He's now on a tag team. He's... The, he's at least used every week, and he at least is on either on the winning. He's at least somewhat on the winning side. So I say Cesaro is being used decent now. He's not being used to I think to his potential, but he's not being used like a joke either. He's actually I think at a good spot with the company at the moment. But it took a while for him to get to at least this spot because he was being jobbed out to the fucking moon. Okay, so next match was a tag team match. Cody Rhodes and Goldust versus Ryback Axel. Uh, this match was alright, but it was really a match you probably see on Monday Night Raw or Friday Night SmackDown um, at the time. Um, Rhodes and Goldust get the advantage in the beginning, and then eventually, um, Curtis Axel hit the sick clothesline on um, Goldust, um, and Ryback Axel pretty much get the heat on. Uh, Goldust for a while. One thing I did say is that even though I wasn't like a huge fan of Ryback, so but I eventually started to like them. Is they really worked really well together as a team. Um, so that's something I will say. And then eventually uh, Goldust hits a 
code red on uh, Curtis Axel, and Cody Rhodes gets the hog tag. He starts going off on Ryback. He actually ended up hitting that double moon sword on Ryback, so and it looks like he actually landed on. Like it looks like Cody Rhodes collided heads with one of them because he was kind of out of it out for a little while after the matchup. Uh, then he goes for the disaster kick. Ryback power bombs him into Goldust, and he tries to hit the get the win with the Miho clothesline, but Goldust breaks up the pinfall. And then Curtis Axel tries to come in. Uh, Goldust hits a scoop slam on Curtis Axel. And then Cody Rhodes hits a crossroads on Ryback and uh, covers him. Curtis Axel breaks up the pinfall and Goldust and Axel take each other out. And then Cody Rhodes goes for the disaster kick again and Ryback counters into the shell shot and covers him and gets the win. And ironically enough, um, at the time I even noticed it as this was the first time Ryback had won a match on a pay-per-view since... I believe I said Money in the Bank 2012. It was a long ass time since uh, Ryback went on to um, had a pay per view win because he didn't wrestle at SummerSlam. He lost to um, he didn't wrestle at Night of Champions either. He lost to CM Punk at Hell in a Cell at Survivor Series. He lost to the Shield um, at TLC. He lost the Royal Rumble match in 2013. He lost to the Shield in, at Elimination Chamber. He lost to Mark Henry at WrestleMania 29. He lost to John Cena um, at Extreme Wars and the um, and Payback a year prior. Um, actually, no, I should, I, I was actually wrong. Um, it actually, it was his first victory since Money in the Bank 2013 because he had beaten Chris Jericho at Money in the Bank 2013. But then he lost to. Um, he didn't have a match at SummerSlam. He had lost to. Um, he didn't have a match at Night of Champions. He lost to CM Punk at, Hell in a, at Battleground in Hell in a Cell 2013. Um, he lost to Mark Henry at Survivor Series. Um, he was on the losing. His team lost to Cody Rhodes and Goldust at uh, TLC. He lost the Royal Rumble match. Um, he lost to Cody Rhodes and Goldust. Um, at Elimination Chamber, um, his, he, his team didn't win the tag titles at WrestleMania. They lost it to the Usos. Um, at Extreme Wars, he didn't wrestle. So this was the first time he had won a match since Money in the Bank 2013. My bad. So it had been, but pretty much what I'm trying to say is it had been a while since Ryback had won a match on paper. So it was interesting. Uh, but then afterwards, uh, Cody Rhodes grabs the mic and he says, "Brother to brother, you need the you need a better tag team partner than me." And then the aftermath of this match came when um, Cody Rhodes would go through um, would have a series of partners for Goldust for him to team up with, and they would lose to Live Axel. So then Cody Rhodes says, "I finally figured out a perfect tag team partner for you," and he picked none other than himself with under a new gimmick. Stardust. So this is when Cody Rhodes became Stardust. This was actually Cody Rhodes' last match under Cody Rhodes in WWE anyways. And uh, Gold and Star um, Gold and Stardust would continue the feud with Ryback. Axel. the feud would blow off at Money in the Bank of that year. And um, eventually Ryback Axel disbanded as a tag team because Ryback ended up getting injured. And then he would come back and he would revitalize the Phoebe more thin. Curtis Axel pretty much went on to do nothing. He got attacked before he could enter the Royal Rumble, so he started doing Axel Mania. And then when Hulk Hogan came out, when well, that whole sex tape came out about Hulk Hogan, um, Curtis Axel pretty much hasn't done anything since then. He was recently in the Social Outcasts with uh, Heath Slater, Adam Rose, and Bo Dallas. And then when that ended, he hasn't done crap. Um, Ryback. So I'll get into Ryback in the next uh, video. Um, and Goldust is actually still with the company. He's about in the same spot, but you know, Goldust is getting old anyways. He, he's been in the business for a while. He doesn't really need to do. He, he he really doesn't need to do this. So, and Cody Rhodes, we could stay as Stardust. Uh, eventually, uh, Golden Stardust would uh, win the tag titles again, and then eventually they would lose them, and then they pretty much disbanded as a tag team. And Stardust and Cody Rhodes wanted to stop doing the Stardust gimmick, but they wouldn't let him. And then this eventually led to Cody Rhodes leaving the company in uh, 2016. So great use of talent right there. Uh, but overall, this match was an average match. Looking back at it, I get a little bit pissed off because of the potential they had with Cody Rhodes. And Ryback-Axel. Uh, not as a team, but as singles wrestlers. Uh, Goldust, you know, they had already... Goldust had already become a stow, so... Yeah. 
Alright, so next match was uh, Rusev with Lana versus Big E. Um, Lana comes out and pretty much praises Vladimir Putin and puts down America, which I thought was fun funny. Um, and this match I liked. It was an explosive match. It wasn't necessarily the greatest match, but it was alright. Uh, Rusev hits a German suplex on Big E. Um, Big E hits a sick clothesline on him, spears him through the ropes, and then Rusev kicks him in the head and it gets him in the accolade and Big E's forced to tap out. I believe the match... Actually, let me I have the time right here. The match was... Um, three minutes and forty seconds. But I did not mind the match. It did what it needed to do. Put Rusev over as a monster, and I used to love it when Lana would give the instructions to have Rusev crush him, and when she would scream "crush," and then she was the one that would have to stop it. I kind of miss that they do that, but they don't really do that anymore. And um, yeah, uh, this match was explosive. And the aftermath came. They would go on to have a Wii match at Money in the Bank where Rusev would also win. And then eventually Rusev would later on in the year go on to beat Sheamus for the U.S. title. And then he would lose it to John Cena at WrestleMania 31. And then there's more on to that later. Um, and then Big E would go on to kind of fiddle around for a little while. And then he would form the alliance of the New Day uh, with Kofi Kingston and Bo Dallas. And um, watching this match too is you see progression in performers and characters with both Rusev and Big E. Rusev is such a better wrestler now than he was back then, um, which is insane. And Big E, so at last year, Big E was just a guy that sat up down around and did this. Who knew that there was more to Big E than that? Um, I didn't put certainly didn't and Big E's definitely grown as a performer now he's got all the he's really charismatic now and you know I, I love the new Big E now so uh yeah it definitely shows that being uh, that you can improve the more you do it and that's what Big E and Rusev did because they've improved because watching them back then uh to now is certainly a huge difference Okay, so next match was Kofi Kingston versus Bo Dallas, and um, Bo Dallas uh, comes out and says that even though the Chicago Blackhawks are going to lose their match, that doesn't make every one of them a loser as long as they both leave, and before the match starts, Kane comes out, beats the crap out of Kofi Kingston, chokeslams him, and tombstones him, leaves, so then Bo Dallas says, gets in the ring and says, Kofi, don't worry, I know things look bad right now, but in no time you're going to be back on your feet. That was it. Waste of time. And obviously they did this because Kofi Kinson was very vocal about Daniel Bryan giving up the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. So I guess this was just really filler. This was not needed on the pay-per-view, and I don't know why they did it. After Matt, there was no follow-up to this. Kofi Kingston and Kane never feuded, really. I think Dallas and Kingston just blew off their feud in a match on the next night where Dallas won. And ironically enough, the guy that's actually had more of a career launching point has been Kofi. He's with He formed the group with the New Day, like I mentioned, and Bo Dallas does nothing. And I, I don't know how I didn't realize it back then, but damn, Bo Dallas sucks. Um... That's all I'm going to say about And Kane obviously went on to pretty much have the same one that he had. He would become corporate again. Then he would switch back to the math. And he's just kind of roaming around the WWE, really. He's in the same spot pretty much that he has been. Next match was a Intercontinental Championship match. Intercontinental Champion Bad News Barrett versus Rob Van Dam. Um... Before the match starts, Bad News Barrett cuts a promo talking about how a lot of people want him, um, want OVD to take the Intercontinental title from him, but he says he's afraid he's got some bad news. Um, he said that not only is he going to ruin OVD's chances of winning the IC title, he's going to ruin his chances by getting paychecks because he's going to be making him take the summer off. And um, then Bad News Barrett says that he's going to knock him out with a pole hammer from B and B, which I did like that line. Uh, this match I thought was an okay match. LVD dominates the first half of it. He hits a thrust kick on Barrett. Um, he hits um, 
a dive on the outside. He hits his little leg drop that um, across the barricade, but eventually Barrett hits a big boot on him, and he dominates the matchup for a long ass time. And then eventually, um, he actually he actually ended up hitting a uh, kick right to the ribs uh, while RVD was pounced up against the ropes. Then RVD hits his comeback. He goes for the uh, five star frog splash. So Barrett moves out of the way. Barrett goes for the um, ball hammer, but RVD counters into a um, head scissors roll up. Well, a um, leg scissors roll up. Barrett kicks out, and then uh, Barrett throws him out of the wind. He uh, when Barrett hits the winter chains on him, RVD kicks out. Then he goes for the uh, bow hammer on the outside. RVD ducks it, and he ends up hitting his arm against the steel post. And then he hits a... Uh, then RVD goes for the uh, split-legged moonsault. Barrett moves out of the... Barrett gets the knees up and hits the bow hammer for the win. And he retains the uh, Intercontinental Championship. And the aftermath of this match came with... Uh, where uh, Barrett... Um, would end up getting injured, so he ended up having to vacate the IC title, and then pretty much he came back, was IC champ again, and then he was released shortly afterwards because he requested it. But Bayer was just somebody that was a huge missed opportunity, and LVD would go on to um, wrestle a few more matches before finally leaving, um, like in at the towards the end of the summer in 2014. Alright, so next was the segment of whether or not Daniel Bryan was going to give up the WWE World Heavyweight Championship or if Brie Bella was getting fired. So, uh, I'm not going to talk about this for too much because it was a bad segment. Stephanie McMahon comes out, asks Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella to come out, the Danielsons, and uh, they come out. Brie Bella, well, Daniel Bryan, Brie, Stephanie McMahon says that you should show a good example for your children. Just give up the title so that you can't physically defend it. Daniel Bryan says that, you know, you got booed pretty loudly. You should look at it as an example of your children and try to make good examples for them. Uh, there was CM Punk chants, and Stephanie McMahon mentions that these people want you to quit just like CM Punk did, which, you know, every time CM Punk gets mentioned in that light, makes me realize that CM Punk probably never will come back to WWE. But it was kind of cool because it was the first time CM Punk had really been mentioned since he had uh, left the WWE. Or quit. I, I mean, he quit. I mean, but whatever. So then, um, Daniel Bryan. So then, Brie Bella says, I think we know what has to be done. So Daniel Bryan acts like he's going to give up the title. Brie Bella stops him and says something. And Stephanie McMahon says... Uh, that, you know, since he's not giving up the title, you know what has to... Then I guess I'm going to ha have to fire you. And Brie Bella says, no, that's where you won. Because I you can't fire me. I quit. Slap Steffi McMahon in the face. Steffi McMahon runs off in Bayless. And Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella celebrate together. Oh, uh, the segment was bad. The reason why is because it wasn't even about Daniel Bryan. It was mainly a to push a feud between Brie Bella and Stephanie McMahon. Like, this segment proves that the WWE never wanted Daniel Bryan as the WWE World Heavyweight Champion because, uh, I mean, it was, he was like, he was pretty much cast aside to push a Stephanie McMahon Brie Bella feud in this segment. The segment was supposed to be about Daniel Bryan, and it just generally wasn't. And now, looking back at this segment, Brie Bella quitting was pointless because they ended up having to take the title from Daniel Bryan, so. Why did they do what they did? If the whole purpose of Buella quitting was so that way Daniel Bryan could keep the title, but in real life, what ended up happening was that he had to give up the title because he just couldn't defend the because he just couldn't defend it. So Brie Bella quitting was pointless. I mean, they dragged this out so much. I think the reason they dragged this out was, was because they knew that if they had Daniel Bryan give up the title, that they were going to get hated for it. So, that's why I think they dragged it out this long. But this eventually led to Brie Bella versus Stephanie McMahon at SummerSlam, where Stephanie McMahon weirdly won for no reason. And, yeah, that was really it. Daniel Bryan didn't could return until January. So, I don't know why they did what they did. The segment's just bad.
All right, so next match was a last man standing match. John Cena versus Bray Wyatt with Luke Harper and Eric Rowan inside. <sighs> I'm going to talk about the match and then give you my thoughts on it. So the Wyatt family are all just going to pick apart Cena. They realize it's three on one, no disqualifications, so they can just beat the shit out of him. But instead... The Usos went out to make the save, and they're gonna and they help even the odds out for Cena. So the Usos are standing in Cena's corner, and Harper and Rowan are standing in Bray Wyatt's corner. So the match starts. You know, Wyatt and Cena have some exchange. Cena hits the bulldog on him. Um, Wyatt gets up. Wyatt hits the uh, clothesline on him. He dominates Cena for a little bit, um, and then Cena, he, he ends up slow dancing with Cena, which I never really got what that was supposed to do. I guess it was supposed to play mind games with Cena, but it was just weird and awkward. And then Cena hits the five moves of doom, goes for the AA, Wyatt counters into a Yoanagi, uh, then Wyatt hits a high forearm. Wyatt hits the uh, Sister Abigail on Cena. Cena gets up. Cena hits the AA, and Wyatt does the exorcism walk to get up. Um, and this just surprises Cena. And Eric Rowan blasts Cena from behind. And one of the Usos gets in, super kicks him in the head. Um, close that. And then the other Uso close lines him out of the win, and it takes himself out. Harper throws the other Uso out. He ends up diving on uh, one of the Usos and Eric Rowan, and then the other Uso hits a whisper to the wind type um, dive on everybody. So then it's just down to Cena and Wyatt. Cena turns around and gets hit with a chair by Wyatt, and. Um, then he throws Cena out of the way and goes to hit him with the chair again. Cena moves out of the way. He starts hitting Wyatt with the chair. Um, Cena goes to throw Wyatt into the steps. Wyatt reverses it, throws Cena into the steps. And then Wyatt hits Cena off the step, up um, with the steel steps a couple of times. Stomps, Cena, stomps the steps into Cena. And um, then um, Cena... Wyatt goes to hit like a concerto on Cena while his head is against the steps. Cena counters it. Um... Hits Wyatt with the steps, and then he takes the steps, and Wyatt's outside the win, and he takes the steps and throws him out of the win, and Wyatt's still able to get up from this, and uh, then Cena goes to go off the barricade, Wyatt hits a sister Abigail on the floor, Cena gets up from that, Cena throws Wyatt up over the bottom part of the steps, which I thought looked like crap, and Cena and Wyatt, Cena realizes Wyatt's going to get up, so he goes to continue the attack. Wyatt back drops him on the steps, and then he hits a senton off the steps, um, and Cena gets up from that. Cena AAs Wyatt on the floor, uh, not still on the fact that his ribs were just crushed by Wyatt or anything, and Cena's about to get the victory, but then Luke Harper and Eric Rowan run out and attack Cena, so the referee kind of has to, like, put, and then, well, then the referee, and they help Wyatt get to his feet because they realize he's not going to get up, and they beat the crap out of uh, Cena because apparently Harper and Rowan and the Usos fought to the back, but we didn't see it. Then the Usos went out, they fight with Harper and Rowan. Uh, they have a couple of tables out there because Wyatt and Cena had been using them. Uh, Harper slams on the table into one of the Usos' face, and they set a bunch of tables up. Um, and Eric Rowan goes to drive one of the Usos, for, for, goes to hit a follow-away slam onto one of the Usos. Through them. The, the, that Uso lands on his feet, hits a super kick, and the hip attack, and drives himself and that Uso through the table. And then Luke Harper superplexes the other Uso um, outside the win through... Uh, two other tables that were set up. So then it's just down to Cena versus Wyatt one on one again. And Cena goes to AA Wyatt again. Wyatt counters it, and then Wyatt hits that that hits that flying forearm through the barricade. They both still get up on that. They brawl in the crowd for a while. They brawl up to the tech uh, the technical area, and Cena pretty much AA's Wyatt through one of those technical boxes, and then he buries Wyatt um, into the other one, and Wyatt. Obviously, isn't going to get up from that, so Cena wins the match and celebrates afterwards. So, this match, I personally think, sucks. Um, here's why. So, this is supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one last man standing match, but yet I'm it felt like I was watching a six-man tag team last man standing match. Because you had Luke Hoppo and Eric Rowan and the Usos out there. And I get they were trying to set up a feud between those two teams. But why did they need to get involved in this match? Why couldn't they have their own match on the pay-per-view? They had a tag match on the show. They could have easily just thrown it in there. And losing team can't get involved. And you have the Usos win that match. And then that way it's a one-on-one -on -one match. 
I think possibly think that would have made sense. Or you could have had Luke Harper and Eric Rowan win that match. Then the Usos can't get involved, and that really puts Cena at a disadvantage. And another thing is why. If you're thinking about this logically, why did Cena even need the Usos out there? Because the Cena's been able to plow through the Wyatt family just fine previously. He plowed, he was able to beat Bray Wyatt um, in pretty much a three-on-one handicap match at WrestleMania. He pretty much beat them in a three-on-one handicap match at Extreme Rules in a cage match. So, yeah. You know, um... This match, I just didn't really think was structured very well. Um, and obviously, it just all was a waste of time just to lead into st- to status quo with Cena standing tall, getting the victory. Yes, 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 that's what happened. And, you know, this, ma- this match right here was pretty much the death of Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt um, pretty much was the hardest act in the company, and then Cena got in his way and buried Bray Wyatt. This was one of last year he did it to Ryback, and well, you know the pre- year prior he did it to Ryback, and on this pay per view he did it to Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt was somebody that had come in. He was a really interesting character. He had a he had a, t- a fantastic match at the Royal Rumble earlier that year against Daniel Bryan. Um, and then, um, and he put him over huge. Um, then the Wyatt family had a, a fantastic match against the Shield at Elimination Chamber. They put the Wyatt family over huge. They pretty much destroyed the Shield. Um, and then it led to WrestleMania. Boy, Wyatt really needed that victory, and it didn't happen. Um, so then in Extreme Wars, Boy, Wyatt can only defeat John Cena because of a little kid sitting in a robe. Well, you know, you know one of those choice choir robes. And he can't beat Cena here. You know, had Wyatt maybe have won the blow-off match, I could have looked past the fact that Cena winning at WrestleMania was stupid. Um, and plus, so, yeah. I think that's what makes this match suck even worse, is the one guy won. Um... So let's take a look at where these superstars went. John Cena obviously was didn't really did um, was fine. He was the WWE World Heavyweight Champion the next fucking month, and then he went on to uh, and he, he's still in the same exact spot. He's the face of the fucking company. Um, he's actually probably a huger star now than he was then because he's actually doing movies and stuff now, and he's going to become a huge mega star probably this year. But let's take a look at what happened to Boy Wyatt. Bray Wyatt went on to Money in the Bank, could not win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship in that vacant World WWE World Heavyweight Championship ladder match. Then he went on to lose to Chris Jericho at Battleground. He went on to de- finally to defeat Chris Jericho at, Bat- at the SummerSlam. He beat him in a cage match. He did not wrestle at Night of Champions, um, and then he lost his coat. And you know, if you're supposed to be a cult leader, you're supposed to have a cult. But he lost his coat for no reason. He set Luke Harper and Eric Rowan free, which made no sense. He had a weird feud with Dean Ambrose. That thank God he won. Um, he had a really good performance in the Royal Rumble match that year, just to get lamely eliminated by Big Show and fucking Kane. Um, he feuded with the Undertaker, which he lost. A match that happened a year too late. And a match that Boy Wyatt probably needed to win. I'll admit, even though it's Taker. Uh, they both needed to win. It was a lose-lose situation. Then he had like a weird feud with Ryback. Where he, for no reason, where he won that. He had this whole feud with Roman Reigns. That he lost. Um, he randomly feuded with the Dudley Boys, Tommy Dreamer, and Rhino for no reason. Um... He was eliminated from the Royal Rumble match. He, his team lost to Kane, Big Show, and Ryback in Fastlane. Like in 2016. And he has the best one. John Cena didn't stop there. They had another run in. So pretty much the Wyatt family has this promo segment with The Rock. Which sounds good in theory. The Wyatt family is working with The Rock. Just to have fucking Eric Rowan lose to The Rock in six seconds. And then Cena and The Rock pretty much still, um, you know, stand tall and take out the Wyatt family. Bray Wyatt was supposed to turn face, but then thanks to fucking Roman Reigns, he got injured. He comes back. 
randomly feuds with the fucking New Day, wins that match, which meant nothing because the Wyatt family split up because Braun Strowman ended up getting drafted over to fucking Raw. Um, ha just recently feud. This is the most recent one. Feud with Randy Orton. It's a terrible feud. Is able to beat Randy Orton. No. Takes out Randy Orton at Backlash. Then just to lose to Kane later on in the night. Where's Kane been since then? Nowhere. Um, and here's the best one. So Bray Wyatt. So Randy Orton joins the Wyatt family. Knowing that when Daniel Bryan did it. He fucking fooled him. And it makes Bray Wyatt look like a more fool. Because we know Randy Orton's turning on him. So Randy Orton did just that. Uh, Bray Wyatt won the WWE Championship at Elimination Chamber um, three years too fucking late. And then he just went on to lose it to fucking Randy Orton at WrestleMania, even though there was a f ton of fucking distractions. Bray Wyatt's been in the company maybe what now? What? So 2013, four years now? Yeah, he, barely, he hasn't won any of his feuds. He um, attacks people for no reason. His promos don't even make sense because every time he cuts a promo, you can't take what he says seriously because he loses every feud. Uh, what else? He hasn't won a WrestleMania match yet. Let's take a look. Lost to John Cena at WrestleMania 30. Lost to The Undertaker at 31. Lost to... Um, he got jobbed out by The Rock and then he just lost to Randy Orton at WrestleMania 33. So that's fucking great for Boy Wyatt. And... In fact, if you think about it, Luke Harper became a fucking champion before Boy Wyatt did. The only titles Boy Wyatt has held was the SmackDown tag titles that he never fucking touched, and the WWE title, which he only held for two fucking months. And he got jobbed out. He lost the title in Randy Orton in less than ten minutes. Just wow! What a what a fucking pile of shit this is. And this is like another victim for Cena. He buried Ryback a year prior. And Ryback put it, Let's take a look where Ryback was on this show. He wrestled in a tag match on this show. That you would have seen on Raw. That, had, that meant nothing. And then Bray Wyatt wrestled John Cena. And the next year he wrestles Ryback. Um, in a match that means nothing. And wait till you see what happens at the next payback. Wait till you see what happens. <sighs> okay, so next match was a Divas Championship match. Divas Champion Paige versus Alicia Fox. And I gotta say, it's really weird for me to watch a Paige match now after everything that's happened. Um, it's definitely interesting. Uh, but this ma I'm just going to say it now. This match sucked a cock. Um, which is kind of ironic because it's a Divas match and they do suck cock. But anyhow. what I don't know what... It was definitely what happened in the win. But also, um, it was JBL's commentary. He ruined this match um, also. He made the match worse than what it really was. Because uh, there was a spot where um, Alicia Fox was crying. And he's like, she crying? You don't cry in wrestling. And the, M M Michael Cole's like, you, she was try playing possum. He's like, I ever heard of possum. And then she like takes a cheap shot at the clown. And he was upset about that. There was a spot where the referee was supposed to count. And he got upset about that. It was just like, shut the fuck up, JBL. This is why I am not a huge fan of JBL on commentary. Ironically enough, those those times where he's been like a great hero commentator, not one of those times. So um, the match pretty much ends with when Paige wins with a PTO, and that's my uh, WWE Champions app. So I apologize for that. But yeah, yeah the match ends when uh, Paige wins with a PTO, and yeah, so that's that. And then afterwards, Alicia Fox, the whole reason people wanted to see this match was to see her freak out because her freak outs were awesome. And she didn't freak out. She just walked away and cried. Yeah, uh, that sucked. And the aftermath came where Alicia Fox pretty much faded away into nothing. Um, and now she's with Noam Dahl in the Cruiserweight division and does jack and shit. 
she's pretty much irrelevant. Uh, she hasn't been relevant since 2010. I'll even maybe say, because maybe since year two, but whatever. Paige. Ooh, hoo, 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 Paige. has definitely had some uh, interesting things happen to her since this. She went on to lose the Divas title. She's been a three-time Divas champion. And, yeah, she's had some very interesting things. Um, she uh, feuded with Charlotte and brought up Charlotte's dead brother. Um, she... Uh, and then randomly turned face right afterwards. Um, then um, she was on the kickoff of WrestleMania 32. Yeah. Paige was on the kickoff of WrestleMania 32. She uh, <laughs> dated um, Alberto Del Rio. <laughs> And uh, the company doesn't want them together, which I, I agree with. Um, and they separated them. They uh, they drafted Del Rio to SmackDown and Paige to Raw. And then Paige got a neck injury. And she's failed two wellness tests. Interesting. And then Alberto Del Rio left the company. Paige proposed to him at, on an indie show. And... Um, yeah, and she's dating Del Rio, who Del Rio, who was married at the time, had two kids and is way older than her. And they just got married not that long ago. She recently showed up backstage at a TNA Impact Wrestling show. And the most interesting thing about Paige is now, um, recently she had her, some private information on her phone got leaked out. Of her making a sex tape with Xavier Woods and Brad Maddox. And since then, I can't look at Paige, Xavier Woods, and Brad Maddox the same ever again. Kind of weird how that works out. And um, now Paige looks like crap. And if, uh, so, yeah. Paige has definitely gone places since this match. So, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to say that I'm probably never going to be able to look at Paige the same ever again. And thank God now I'm at the match I actually want to rewatch because uh, this show sucked. I think I thought it was average at the time, uh, but watching it back, it sucks. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to rate this show a good show uh, because the last match is a really good match. But it's not enough to save this show. And I even have some problems with that man. So I'll talk about it. Let me watch it first. And then I'll talk about it. Okay. So next they cut to the panel. And it was only. Um, it was everybody else excluding Kofi Kinson. Since he had been laid out by Kane earlier in the night. And um, they pretty much just talked about everything that happened in the pay-per-view. So nothing really else, much else to say there. Okay, so then we had the main event. It was a six-man tag team elimination no-holds-barred match. The Shield versus Evolution. And this match, I thought, was fantastic. There's just one thing about this match that kind of ruined it for me. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the match starts. And the Shield and Evolution just brawl. Uh, for a long ass time, Roman Reigns brawls with uh, Batista, and I forgot to mention it, but Batista was very blue in this match. And I don't mean like he was blue like he was sad. I mean like he was blue, like his attire was all blue, and it would have been noticeable, but everybody else was wearing black attire, and he was very blue. It was awesome, actually. I thought it was pretty funny. I actually got a blue Tista chance, though, did. Poor Batista. He really didn't have a good run in WWE in 2014. First he was Batista, then he was Blue Tista, then he was, then he was Blue Tista. And then he was Bi Tista. Poor Batista. I do feel bad for him. But also Seth Rollins blogged with Triple H and Dean Ambrose blogged with Randy Orton. They all just blogged all over the place. Ambrose bounced Orton's head off the announcer's table. Uh, Rollins and Triple H blogged in the crowd. And Reigns and Batista pretty much blogged around ringside. And uh, Rollins and Triple H blogged back to the win. Orton hit a back suplex on the barricade on Ambrose. And uh, Reigns threw Batista into the steps. And eventually... 
the match just randomly like turn into a traditional six-man tag match, which I kind of had a problem with because this match was supposed to be a no-holds-barred elimination match, and they just worked it like it was a six-man tag for about maybe 15 minutes for, um, during the match, which I kind of hated. Uh, but they dominated uh, Batista for a while in this match, and then Batista is able to hit a spine buster on Ambrose, um, and Evolution dominate Ambrose for a little bit. Uh, but then eventually it, it comes. Uh, Roman Reigns and Triple H both get tagged in, and they have a little bit of a face off with each other, and they start chain wrestling each other. And the Shield dominate Triple H for a while until eventually, when Ambrose went to go off the second turnbuckle, Triple H caught him with a uh, got, was able to get his uh, leg up. And then Batista got tagged in. He Irish whipped Ambrose a couple of times into the barricade. And Evolution just pretty much pick up out Dean Ambrose for a while. I thought it was actually some pretty good stuff. That, uh, I thought it was some good tag team moves they hit on, e on each other. And then eventually Ambrose hit a uh, rebound clothesline on uh, Triple H. And Roman Reigns got the hot tag on Batista. He started going off on him. He hits the Superman punch on him. And... And then he goes for the um, then he goes to cover him. Randy Orton breaks up the pinfall, and then the match spills back out into chaos throughout the rest of the time. And uh, Rollins balls with Triple H, Ambrose balls with Randy Orton again, and uh, Roman Reigns balls with Batista. And Rollins and Triple H brawl up to the technical area, and Rollins goes to dive on Triple H, and and Triple H is able to um, hit him with a monitor while he's in the air. Which I thought was awesome. And Randy Orton and Dean Ambrose brawled for a while. But you didn't really see what happened with them. And then Roman Reigns is about to put Batista through the Spanish announcer's table. But then he gets ambushed by Randy Orton. And Tri Triple H. Uh, Triple H tosses him into the... Uh, Steel steps, and then Evolution hit a triple power bomb on Roman Reigns uh, through the announcers table, which I thought looked really cool. And then they do the shield pose, and then Dean Ambrose run, runs across the announcers tables and and takes out Evolution. Um, and Seth Rollins dives on both Triple H and Randy Orton, and. Pretty much, the uh, Rollins and Ambrose are trying to fight off the odds of Evolution because it's a three-on-two disadvantage since Roman Reigns has been laid out. And but the Evolution just gets the numbers game, and Triple H hits Ambrose and Rollins a couple of times in the back with a steel chair. They're fighting on the stage at this point, and Randy Orton hits a back suplex on the chair, and Triple H pedigrees Rollins on the chair, and you don't see Rollins for a while. And then Evolution sees that Roman Reigns and the win about to get to his feet. So they go to pick him apart. They pick uh, Roman Reigns, tries to fight back. But Batista hits a spine buster on Reigns. And then they grab the steel steps. And Randy Orton grabs three kendo sticks. And they take off Roman Reigns' shield attire. And it, Roman Reigns is just strapped down to, uh, has no shirt on. And um, Triple H hold Randy Orton back as each member of Evolution takes a turn, um, hitting Roman Reigns in the back with the kendo sticks. I thought this looked brutal and awesome. And Roman Reigns and Randy Orton went to grab a chair. Roman Reigns tries to fight back. He he goes off the steel steps and hits a Superman punch on Orton. Triple H hits Orton, uh, Triple H hits Reigns in the back with the chair. And they continue, and then, then Evolution and Reigns fight up to the stage, and Ambrose um, tries to fight back, t starts taking out Evolution, but then Randy Orton hits a drape and DDT like, off the stage, and then um, Evolution thinks that they have this match well in hand, they're just going to destroy everybody, but then Seth Rollins dives off the Titan Tron on all three members, I thought that looked awesome, and all, all three members fight back to the win, Rollins goes for a blockbuster on Batista, Batista catches him with a spear, and then he goes for the Batista bomb. Rollins fights out of it and Reigns spears Batista. Rollins covers him and eliminates Batista. And then Randy Orton starts to get to his feet. Randy Orton hits an RKO on Rollins. He goes to eliminate him. Roman Reigns breaks up the pinfall. And then uh, Orton goes for the draping DDT on Reigns. Ambrose hits Orton in the back with a chair and hits a dirty deed on the, on the chair. Um, on to Orton and uh, covers Orton and eliminates him. So then it's down to a three-on-one match, the Shield versus Triple H. And um, 
Roman Reigns hits a Superman punch on Triple H, uh, but he can't capitalize to make the fin pinfall because Batista spears him. And then, and before Randy Orton leaves, he hands him the slug hammer, and Triple H hits Ambrose off the head with the slug hammer. But then Rollins takes him out with a dive in high knee, and then Roman Reigns hits the spear on him for the win, and the Shield win, and they won in a shutout. There was a complete clean sweep. Uh, all three members of the Shield were able to survive, and that talk about giving somebody a massive puff. Talk Talking about really putting over a team, and that's exactly what the Shield did. This would have been better if the Shield had um, lost the first match. You could say, well, then it evens it evens up up one one, but it, it would have made it look so much impressive that they were able to completely clean sweep Evolution if they had lost the first match. I thought so. I actually personally think that uh, this would have been more impressive if Evolution had won the first match because then they said, well, they just took out this group. Um, anyways, uh, but it was awesome. It was an awesome moment for the Shield. But then the aftermath of this match came, and there's a lot of stuff that came after this match. Um, the next night on Raw, Triple H said that this battle wasn't over yet, and he wanted to finish the job. Uh, but Batista wasn't interested. He wanted to go. Out, he wanted to go back to go after what he came here to do, and that's win the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. But Triple H wouldn't give him what he wanted because they, they had to take out the Shield first, so Batista quit. Um, and, the, and this ended up being Batista's actually last match in the WWE. Um, and it probably will be his last match in the WWE. So then they had to go to Plan B, and the Plan B was Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins ended up turning on the Shield, and Jordan forces with Triple H and the Authority. Um... Which was a huge shocker, you know, the sh uh, this all happened the next night, Seth Rollins turning on the shield, uh, and it was a perfect way to break up the shield, the guy that started it ended up breaking it up, and this led to uh, the feud of the year between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, uh, this also launched off other angles like Roman Reigns and Randy Orton, they had they ended up having a match at SummerSlam, uh, which was a really good match, which was a good match, and um... You know, this launched off other things. This heard Seth Rollins became the top heel of the company uh, for a couple of years. Uh, he went on to become the, uh, to win the Money in the Bank ladder match at Money in the Bank, um, and then he ended up uh, and Roman Reigns after the Shield breaking up. Roman Reigns would go on to win the Royal Rumble that um, in 2015, and um, Dean, uh, Roman Reigns would go on to main event WrestleMania. Rollins would cash in the Money in the Bank. First ever superstar to cash in his Money in the Bank at WrestleMania. And he walked out WWE World Heavyweight Champion. The very next year, uh, these four superstars competed in a match with each other. It was Randy Orton facing Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns in a fatal four-way match for the title. And then Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose would continue their feud. Um, and then... Um, Roman Reigns was uh, Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose still continued a, a, a mutual friendship, and then eventually um, Seth Rollins ended up getting injured. So this launched off Triple H versus Roman Reigns for the title at WrestleMania 32. Triple H was also wrestled Dean Ambrose for the title, and then Triple H just recently wrestled Seth Rollins for the title uh, this year at WrestleMania, and then we eventually got at Battleground 2016 got the Shield Triple Threat match we wanted, um, and now all the three members of the Shield are baby faces, so we could get a possible reunion. We've had a couple of reunions. We had a reunion the, the very next year at Payback. Then we had a. Um, Reunion at Survivor Series 2016 when they triple powerbomb AJ Styles through the announcers table, which was awesome. So there's been some stints of a reunion. I don't know if we're gonna ever gonna get a full on Shield reunion. I think we will at some point. Um, and also another thing we got was we did get a Randy Orton Seth Rollins feud going into WrestleMania 31, which was pretty damn cool. So. Uh, you know, a lot of I would say there was a lot of benefits coming out of this. You made three new stars in the Shield. You would, you advanced a lot of storylines like Roman Reigns, Triple H, uh, Roman Reigns, Randy Orton, um, Randy Orton, Seth Rollins, Triple H, Seth Rollins. Uh, all three members of the Shield at least feuded with each other, except for Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns feud. We haven't gotten that yet, which I'd like to see at some point. So overall. This match was fantastic. Just like I said, my only gripe was when it just randomly ended up being like a normal six-man tag match throughout the middle of it. If you had, if this match had just spilled in the chaos the whole time, I would have um, loved it even more. But uh, that's just a little bit of a nitpick there. But overall, a really good match.
Okay, so uh, the end we had Payback Fallout, and we had Josh Matthews, Booker T, and Alex Riley on the panel for it. And pretty much they just talked about the angles, but that they had came occasionally had press conference segments involving certain superstars that were on the show that I'll talk about. Um, so first, um, Hornswoggle got interviewed about uh, losing. Uh, his hair, and he talks about how his hair was his career, and he says that now that he's lost his hair, his hair, his career is pretty much over, and then he kind of flipped out and left. I actually thought it was pretty funny. Uh, and then, uh, John Cena got interviewed, and he talked about how, um, you know, um, he, he pretty much gained respect for Bray Wyatt, how he's a future champion in the WWE, typical Cena stuff. And then The Shield got interviewed, and they talk about how they were in the war, and Dean Ambrose was actually, since he was so weak, had his head just laying down on the table, which I thought was pretty funny. And then he said, um, Dean Ambrose um, says that they were in a war, and they just wanted a little bit more, and Roman Reigns says that their wounds are going to heal, but their pride, but they kept their pride, and their... Uh, integrity and then Bo Dallas gets interviewed and he says that he's disappointed that he didn't get to face off against Kofi Kinston but he always looks at the positive things and he says that he's still undefeated in the WWE and he says that he would like to face Kofi Kinston at some point because he seems like a really good guy and then Cesaro and Paul Heyman get interviewed and Paul Heyman says that he's disappointed to be in the same company as Sheamus because Sheamus says he was going in there to fight Cesaro um, but he didn't go out there in there and fight him at all because of the fact that he ended up beating him with a wrestling hold. And then Alicia Fox randomly invades the panel. Well, not the panel, but the press conference. And uh, she says that you guys invite me to a party and you don't invite me. And she says that um, you better ask me questions and you better be good ones. And they're asking her questions about the match, but she doesn't like them. And then she has a flip out. She flips over a table. I actually thought this was really funny. And that was the payback fallout. I actually enjoyed it. It was pretty enjoyable. So, yeah. Okay, so now I figured I would go back through the matches and see if they if this pay-per-view stuck with its theme as payback, if anybody actually got revenge on anyone. So, I would say that in the pre-show match, um, El Torito got, we ended up getting payback on uh, Hornswoggle before beating him in a match and saving his hair for whipping his tail off. I guess technically I could say that Sheamus got payback on Cesaro for uh, the constant attacks on him. Um, there was no payback in the tag team match. There was no payback in the match between Rusev and Big E. There really wasn't any... The, the match between Kofi and Bo Dallas really wasn't a match. Um, I guess technically you could say Kane got payback on Kinson for talking shit to him. I don't know. I wouldn't really say that's payback either. Um... Bad News Barry didn't get any payback on OVD. It was just a traditional match. John Cena definitely didn't get payback against Boy Wyatt because he beat because he pretty much buried Wyatt. If anybody, if Wyatt had won that match, that actually would have been payback. And Paige didn't get any payback on Alicia Fox. And the Shield, you could didn't really get any payback on Evolution. They just won the match. Had Evolution won at Extreme Rules, then that would have fit the stipulation. So, yeah, overall, this this pay per view again didn't fit the theme um, of payback. I believe the only people that got payback were El Torito and Sheamus. So, great job for sticking to the theme of the pay per view. Okay, so now I figured I'd come on here and give you my overall thoughts on the show. Um, it's definitely changed from when I watched it at the time. I think at the time I watched it, I thought this was an average show. Um, and watching it back, I it's actually changed. I think this show actually completely sucks. Um, mainly because of the aftermath and everything. Um, so, um, let me go through the matches again. So, uh, El Torito Hornswoggle, I actually had fun watching that match. It was actually pretty funny. Um, I really enjoyed watching it because of the fun factor. I really enjoyed that United States title match. Um, that was a really good match. Uh, just the one person went over. Uh, but everything from that tag team match up until the, um, IC title match, um, the tag title match, the tag team match was okay. A match you'd see on Raw, though. The, uh, the match between Rusev and Big E was okay. Kofi and Bo Dallas was unneeded. 
The IC title match was just alright, but all that stuff was probably on stuff you would see on a Monday Night Raw or a Friday Night SmackDown. Um, and then we had that segment, where I actually forgot because it's not on here, uh, where Daniel Bryan had to give up the title. That segment was lame, and that actually technically did fit in with the theme of the show where Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella finally got payback at Stephanie McMahon for constantly trying to take the title away from him and constantly antagonizing them and getting Daniel Bryan hurt and everything. Um... That last man standing match between Cena and Wyatt sucked because of the way the match was structured and because of the outcome. The Divas title match sucked because of the commentary and the match just itself sucked. And the match of the night was the no holds bowed. Well, the match of the show, I should say, um, was the no holds bowed elimination six man tag match between the Shield and Evolution. That was some really good shit. But still, it had a few issues in there, like where they had, you know, um, that way it was just a randomly, just a regular tag match throughout the middle. So overall, this show sucked. If I had to rate it, I'd probably rate it a uh, 4 out of 10. Um, because the, there's only t two good things on this show. Well, three good things on this show. Um, and that's the, uh, the pre-show match. Which I totally suggest you watch because if you want to watch some comedy. Uh, the US title match and the main event. Um, everything else... Is either just average or just sucks. Um, so, yeah, you really don't need to go back and rewatch this show. It's terrible um, and it's not worth your time. Okay, that's pretty much it, guys. Make sure to uh, subscribe to this channel if you haven't. And make sure to subscribe to my CM Brothers on the Talkinator channel and all the other channels down below. And that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.